Good morning. So today's going to look a lot different than normal. It is 1030. It's 1029. We're starting a minute early. Don't worry. Nobody's dying. Nobody's sick. And we're going to be done. Huh? I know, but I'm saying like that, you know, nothing's wrong. We're going to end by 1130 today. Okay. All right, I don't have time for the riffraff discussion if we're going to get done by 1130. We're back. We're through our Passover psalm, so now we're back to where we were. Psalm 47. Come, everyone, clap your hands. Yeah. Shout to God with joyful praise. There you go. See, that reggae Christian music got you going this morning. Sorry, y'all missed the best 30 minutes of our lives. I'll play it at the end. Okay, because at the end, some people got to go today. But if you don't, we can do it again. If you have not discovered reggae Christian music, I watched Pete dance for 30 minutes. Pete danced. I think that was dancing. Jennifer danced. Jeff danced. All right, come everyone, clap your hands. Shout to God with joyful praise for the Lord. Most high is awesome. He is the great king of all the earth. He subdues the nations before us, putting our enemies beneath our feet. Thank you, Lord. He chose the promised land as our inheritance, the proud possession of Jacob's descendants whom he loves. God has ascended with a mighty shout. The Lord has ascended with trumpets blaring. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king over all the earth. Praise him with a psalm. God reigns above the nations sitting on his holy throne. The rulers of the world have gathered together with the people of the God of Abraham. For all the kings of the earth belong to God. He is highly honored everywhere. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here. We sound the trumpets to announce you're the king. Your son Jesus is the king. Father, we shout praises to you today. We're going to praise you. We're small in number, but we're going to praise you today. Father, I just pray that you accept our praise, that it's glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, let your Holy Spirit lead us. Amen. Wendy wants me to say a quick prayer for the people that are sick, a lot of people sick. Father, we just lift up those who are sick today to you, and we ask for your supernatural healing, Lord. No coincidence that that's what part of the scripture is today that we're going to talk about, is you are faithful to heal us. So we pray for their healing as they're watching online. If they're just sitting at home resting, we pray for the healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Tovu manayim 
שבת אחים גם יחד הנה מה טוב הנה מה טוב לילה לילה
Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. And I'm not backing down from any giant. Cause I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good and I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. What the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good.
Just to be clear, when we said we have a timeline, it's not like scripted out. But good job, son. Even with your jokes, you're ahead of schedule. <laughs> I don't like scripting things out. We like that the Holy Spirit move and go and... But half our church is leaving at a certain time, so <laughs> I got to... <laughs> See, the good news is I think I can do it in 25 minutes, but I have 35 minutes, so I may string it out just a little bit. But I'm keeping a timer here just to make sure. It's going to be uncharted territory for me today, all right? So this is our final week in the book of James. It is our final week in the book of James. Fifteen weeks. 
to get through this very small kind of hidden book back there in the New Testament. And last week, James gave us two simple formulas, and we kind of had a lot happen last week, so I just want to kind of get our minds back into it. The first simple formula was expect hard times as a believer, but find joy in your hard times, and that's not easy, right? Patiently endure those hard times, and God will reward you. Just a reminder, you're probably not going to see the reward tomorrow or next week. You might, but we're working for eternal rewards, not earthly rewards. I'll take the earthly rewards, but we're working for eternal rewards. The problem is we can't see them, so sometimes we lose the, lose the motivation to work for them. And by the time you get to that point, you can't work for them. Like, you, you got to do it now, right? We're building the treasures up now. So keep persevering. Try, try, try to find joy. If you're having a hard time finding joy in a, in a tough day, turn on some Christian reggae. How great thou art will never be heard the same way again. Right, Jennifer? Number two, James said, don't break your promises, your vows. Let your yes be yes, your no's be no's. I told you guys last week, I go back and listen to every week's sermon to see what I screw up, and I screwed up something and nobody told me. At the end, I said, let your yeses be no's and your no's be no's. <laughs> And everybody looked at me funny, and I thought, well, you got to speak up. You got to say, hey, hey, you screwed up. Somebody said, we know what you meant. Good, thank you. So just to be clear, let your yeses be yes and your noes be noes. So I've made a vow today to be done by 1130. I've got to let my yes be yes and my no be no. Now, Peyton, if you're going to make fun of me, <laughs> you can't sit back there in the back and talk. <laughs> And disrupt me strategically. <laughs> so today we pick up in James 5, verse 13. And James has given us final instructions. You got this on your sheet? Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. So I'm going to ask you guys. So I think Peyton and Parker had this strategic thing <laughs> going this morning. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you guys, are any of you suffering hardships? James says if you are, complain about it, groan about it, gossip about it, blame somebody else. Is that not what he said? He didn't say any of those things. He said pray. But what do we do? We have hardships and we complain and we blame somebody else and we gossip about others so we feel better about ourselves. James says, pray. So when we have these bad things happen, do we stop and pray? Maybe the answer is no. Maybe it's sometimes. Maybe it's always. This whole book has been about a progression. If it's never, get to every once in a while. If it's sometimes, get to all the time. If it's all the time, keep going. Is that our first thought? He says, if you're suffering hardship, pray. So this is your first challenge of the day. When something bad happens to you, stop and pray. That's what I want you to think about this week. If something bad happens, stop and pray. This week, as you know from last week, we came in here, we had no water. I don't know how much a well pump cost. I prayed. And, and you know what? God answered our prayer because it wasn't the whole pump. It was just the wiring for it. It was still a lot of money, but he answered our prayer. That was a hardship. That was a hardship. That's money we got to come up with. This unexpected expense, bigger than some people's mortgages. But I prayed, and at the end of the day, when Wendy called me and said, this is how much it is, I went, praise God, because I thought it was going to be four or $5,000. So it's all about our mindset. Do we stop and pray? That's your challenge this week. Stop and pray when you have a hardship. But when you're happy, praise the Lord, and sometimes you need to praise the Lord to get happy. As Pete would say, your happy feet. When I dance, he calls it the happy feet. Verse 14, are any of you sick? It's funny, we got some people sick today. We in the book of James, are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you committed any sins, you will be forgiven. So there's three things that I want to quickly point out in that scripture. If anyone has ever wondered, and I don't think you guys do, but if we got somebody watching online or we'll watch later, if you wonder why we anoint you with oil when we pray, this is the biblical scripture for it. 
Unfortunately, some churches consider that weird. It's scripture. Pete says it works. James said, do it. Anoint with oil when we pray. This is, we always ask for your permission. Can we do it? We don't just force it. But we ask for your permission, and this is the scripture where we're told to do it. Secondly, it says a prayer offered in faith. It's not just the action of doing the prayer. We've got to actually have some faith behind the prayer. Prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make, make you well. So the first thing is you've got to do it. The second is you've got to actually believe something's going to come out of it. But look at our churches today, and this is not directed at anyone that's sick in here now. When we get sick in America, we say, let me recluse away from everyone so I don't get you sick. But how many of us pick up the phone and say, come to my house and pray over me, I'm sick. Most people present this scripture as come to the church and get prayed over. That's not what it said. It said you should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you. So that's a challenge. If you get sick, Monica never gets sick, so Monica will never have to do this because she has faith. But if you get sick, call us. We'll come pray over you. But here at the end, the third thing I want to kind of point out, because James throws in another one of these little sentences that we can so quickly overlook. He says, if you've committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Why is he talking about your sins and forgiveness when he talks about sickness? See, we don't hear this taught much, right? When he said it makes people mad. But our sins can actually be tied to our sickness. And our sins can definitely hinder our healing. Now, I want to be clear. I didn't say every time you get sick, you've sinned. So then you're scared to call us to say, come pray, pray, because you're like, he's going to wonder where I sinned. That's not what I'm saying. But Peyton said something a couple of weeks ago, and I may butcher this, but he said something to the effect of, crap, I can't remember how he said it now. What was it, one of your first questions if somebody's going through a tough time is? Okay, I feel better. He doesn't remember what he said. But basically, we got to stop and evaluate. Like, maybe we got to stop and say, hey, do I have sin that I need to deal with, that I need to ask for forgiveness with? Is that causing me sickness? Is that hindering sickness? We know that even science says now that unforgiveness towards someone, which is sin, can create long-term diseases. I wrote about this in the book, but cancer patients now, totally secular, not biblically based, are saying when they see cancer patients, when they walk them through trying to let go of pain towards someone, which is by definition forgiveness, that's when they see healing. So I don't want to just gloss over this and miss that sometimes our sins, our unforgiveness, unforgiveness for our sins can hinder our healing. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Verse 17, Elijah was a human as we are. So that's good to know. He's not above us. He was a human just like us. That's encouraging. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. I'm going to kind of go back to the beginning and dissect the beginning of that, verse 16, and then get to verse 17. So it says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. How many of us wake up every day and think, who can I confess my sins today to so I can be healed, so I can be forgiven? That's not what we're taught. We're taught and modeled, unfortunately, in churches by our spiritual leaders to hide our sins. If that weren't the case, there wouldn't be a mega church pastor this week being found out for 40 plus years of sexual sin towards minors that has wrecked one of the biggest churches in America. If we live this out, that's why I've always stood up here. That's why I did my testimony. I gutted myself through it on YouTube. 
If we are willing to confess our sins, we can be healed. If we don't, we hold it in. God's not going to let that stay in forever. Script, there is scripture, I don't have it here on, on this today, that says God will expose these hidden sins. And he will deal with them. And that's what he's doing right now. Two major pastors, big names in the past two weeks, have been ousted. Tony Evans and Robert Morris. Two huge names. But we're supposed to be, I'm the pastor, supposed to be teaching, confess your sins, and the pastors aren't confessing their sins. We're taught to hide it. Don't confess it. And guys, that's why we've really tried hard to create an environment where it's safe to come confess sins. If you come confess it, I want to hug you. Now, we may have to challenge you. We may have to get on to you if you keep doing it. I'm not saying it's like, oh, just keep on sinning. But come confess it so you can get it out. Of course, the enemy doesn't want you to do that, though, right? He doesn't want you to confess your sins. He wants you to feel nasty and dirty and nobody will accept you. He wants you to, to make you feel like you got to give up because you're too dirty. But Scripture says right here, if you confess your sins, if you're transparent about your sins, you receive healing. So you can hold it in, stay sick, Disobey Scripture. God's probably going to expose it at some point, and we're going to get comments like, oh, I can't believe that person. Or we can just freely give it out. Hey, I'm going to sit up here and tell you everything I'm going through because I don't want you to sit there one day and go, oh, I can't believe that Jason did that. I want you, if you hear that rumor, to say, no, I know him. I know he'll tell me what's going on. I know he'll stand up and confess it or at least come and ask the question. Because unfortunately, when a mega pastor like that goes down, thousands of people get hurt. Anybody ever heard of Mark Driscoll? Mars Hill Church, Washington State, Seattle, Washington, one of the biggest churches in America at the time back in the early 2000s. One of the first huge mega churches. Many campuses, thousands of people, 30, 40, I can't remember, 1,000 people. And he spiritually abused people so bad that today you can go find podcasts of his ex, that church went under, and he's now in Arizona restarting a new thing, already causing controversy in the last couple of weeks. But if you listen to podcasts, they interviewed the old pastors that worked at Mars Hill, and many of them have walked away from Jesus. That's the problem. When we don't confess our sins and then it gets found out later, it's bigger than our healing. It hurts others. If we confess it, we get healed. We show others that we're human. We can walk through things with people and then we don't get this shock that, that hurts 30, 40, 50, 100,000 people. We do need to be praying. Wendy said we need to be praying for them. I'm not calling them out to harshly get on to them. I am disappointed in them that they don't live out Scripture, but we need to be praying for them. We need to lift them up in prayer that God will heal them, that they will be radically changed because they could have a great testimony out of this. But the thing is, in, in the church world, it, sometimes if we tell each other our sins, we, we don't, people don't want to be around us, or we at least have that perception, right? I may have told this story before, but I tried to get kicked out of my first small group that Mindy, Wendy made me go to. Wendy made me go to a small group. She made me. I didn't want to go. She guilted me. She didn't mean to. But she's like, everybody else's husband will be there. And I'm like, oh, God, I got to go. And she was going to go by herself. And then I'd be totally humiliated when I snuck into the back of church the next Sunday and snuck out early. So I had to go, right? And then the guy said, give your testimony. I was like, I'll do it because my perception was if I tell people who I am, they'll kick me out of here and I won't have to come back. Why do we have that feeling? Yeah, it's kind of, you're laughing, but it's kind of like, <laughs> it's very comical. Turn that all the way around. I ended up going, being hired by a church to start small groups because of that testimony. See, God can use our stupidity. That's a side note. I'm going to go over my 30 minutes now. That's a side note. God can use our stupidity, our brokenness, to do some great things when we confess our sins, when we're transparent to people. 
But here's the deal. If I tell you my sins, you don't want to be around me anymore. This is going to sound really harsh, but it's going to be like, bye-bye. Bye. That's not what I want. Because I'm going to follow Scripture. I'm going to try to teach it. I'm trying to be obedient. Not perfect at it, but I'm trying. And I'm trying to reap rewards for it. And that's what I want for you. But here's the deal. Flip this around. If somebody confesses their sins to you, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to handle it? Are you going to judge them? Are you going to be harsh with them? Are you going to love them? We'll help you if you need help in what to do. If you need advice. If somebody comes to you and confesses a sin, a good starting point is give them a hug. Embrace them. Make them feel normal. Ask them how you can walk with them to help them through this, not fix it. How can I walk through this with you? Because if you can't do that, or if someone can't do that to you when the Word of God says to do it, you're either very critical, which is a sin, and also pride that you don't have sin, or you got sin you don't want anybody else finding out about, so you don't want somebody confessing to you because then you might have to confess to them. That's the church world. That What I just explained is the criticalness, and I want to hide it so I don't have to give you my problems. That's the church world, not confess your sins one to another. But here's the deal. When you get it out, it's a huge relief. And how many of you have confessed a sin? And when you got it out, you went, wow, that wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. Oh, whew. I kind of got chills just saying that then because I've experienced it. You get it out, and it's like, oh, because when you hold it in, Satan's holding that over you and oppressing you and pressing you down. You build up how bad it's going to be, how much people are going to reject you, and you let it out, and it's so relieving and freeing. And I'm telling you once again, if it's not, and they judge you and they condemn you, it's probably a good sign to set a boundary and get away. Now, this doesn't mean you got to, you know, rent TV time on all the lo local Knoxville air, you know, news and go on there and say, let me, it's confession time. I'm not saying you got to go announce it to the world on social media because there's going to be any plethora of keyboard warriors out there that may or may not even exist that are going to tell you how bad you are. I saw something this week where a guy said some things out on, on Twitter, and they were completely unbiblical. He said, y'all are unbiblical with this thought, and he laid out his thoughts completely unbiblical. And somebody responded and said, you are unbiblical, and he responded and said, I know. That's Satan working through a person, posing as someone to put something out there. And how many people read the first tweet but not the comments? Because I read it, and I was like, oh, I don't ever do this, but I'm about to comment on this total stranger's thing, but I'm going to read the comments first. And I realized he's doing this on purpose. He's trying to start fights. He's not even a believer. But how many people fall for that, right? So I'm not saying go tell the world. I'm asking you to find someone you love and you trust. Develop that relationship in this room. I don't know what to suggest for you guys online. Come to us. But develop those trusting relationships with someone who is spiritually on the same page as you. I have a friend that came to me one day and said, I need to confess some sin. And he confessed it, and it was something a lot of men struggle with. And I, gave, I hugged him, prayed with him, and gave him advice. And he said, I went to one of my other friends, and I know that man. That's a godly man. And when I told him, he said, that's okay, man. We all struggle with it. That's not the friend you want. You don't want the friend that says your sin's okay because everybody else is doing it. You want the friend that says, I will hug you, I will love you, I will pray for you, and now I will challenge you and help you. So I want to be careful. We're not just posting. Now, I will post it out to the world because I want it to heal someone. I want it to help someone. But I'm not suggesting you all have to go do that. I'm saying find someone you trust. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power, produces wonderful results. Elijah was a human as we are. I know I've already read this, but I'm going back over it. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. 
So he's told us, pray when you suffer, pray when you're sick, pray expecting healing, confess your sins so that you can be healed, and then he tells us how powerful our prayers can be. Elijah was so righteous, the rain obeyed his prayers. But none of us are like Elijah, right? But it said Elijah was a normal person, just like us. And maybe, just maybe, we're not getting all of our prayers answered because we're not approaching righteousness at the level someone Elijah did. Someone like Elijah did. Did I say that right? Elijah was so righteous, the rain obeyed his prayers. And my hope is that we're pursuing that kind of righteousness, being right with God, and not, con- not looking at that as I'm working my way into a relationship with God. I love God so much. I love Jesus so much that I want to obey Him, and I want to do what's right, and I want to make changes, because I want to get to that point where my prayer changes your life and my life. Maybe we're so focused on our status and how big our church is and how many followers we got and our finances and our friends and our social networks, all these selfish things, that we lose sight of the fact that we're supposed to pursue obedience and righteousness. I've been praying for this. I've been praying for that. I've been praying for this blessing or that blessing. God hasn't answered me. Maybe he hasn't answered you because it's not in his will. Maybe you're Joseph and you got to be sold into slavery to get to where you need to be. Again, I'm not saying if your prayer is not answered, it's, it's just like with healing. If you're not healed or if you're sick, that doesn't necessarily mean you sinned. If your prayer is not answered, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not righteous. It could just be God's will for a bigger plan that we don't see today. But are we expecting God to be the genie, as Wendy says, when we're not even pursuing righteousness? I saw something that said Jesus spent eight hours a day at least, we don't know, you know, obviously he spent all this time with him, but eight hours a day for three and a half years, it came out to like 8,000 hours, I might have that wrong, that he at least spent with them. And we think we can come to church for an hour or two on Sunday morning and get all we need. I'm not saying all of us, I'm saying the church in general. I will show up for that hour, I will show up for that two hours, and I'll get all my righteousness for the week to try to survive. James has spent four and a half chapters helping us understand how to be righteous. And now he finishes by telling you why it matters. The final instructions of a powerful letter. And, you know, there was a period for us, and I'm going to kind of label it as 2013 to 2019, that Wendy and I and the boys, we had many opportunities. We had so many opportunities to pray for the sick, to pray for people for healing. And it's not that we stopped in 2020. As we all know, things changed in 2020. COVID changed everything. It, it's, it made people have less faith. In general, it made the church have less faith. It made the church quit trying. Sp- specifically in healing. When COVID hit, I said, come in. Come in so we can lay hands on you and anoint you with oil so we can pray over you. And we got called dangerous for doing that. I'm just trying to follow Scripture, and now I'm dangerous by the church. But back before then, so I'm just saying it kind of changed. It's not that we quit praying over people. It's not that, that people quit getting healed after that. I'm just saying there was this period of like six years, 2013 and 19, that we would pray over people, and cancer would go. Somebody would go in and get an get a, a MRI done and have cancer. Undeniable. Pray over them, anoint them with oil. They would go in a week later, and the doctor would say, I don't know. I can't explain it. There's nothing there. People would have major heart problems, and the heart surgeon would say, I don't really understand. Your, your body supernaturally created a vein to go around what should have killed you. We saw a woman's leg grow in this room right over there. And it was not fake like half of these Benny Hinn type things. But here's the thing, we would often ask people if they had any sins they needed to confess. I've kind of forgot about this until I got to this scripture. We would ask them if they needed to confess sin or ask for forgiveness. Before we prayed for their healing. And that's what James is telling us right here in scripture. But as Wendy mentioned earlier, sometimes it's offended people. I came to you for prayer for healing. Why are you suggesting I have sin? I didn't suggest you had sin. I'm trying to follow Scripture and make sure you don't have sin hindering it. 
I'm just trying to live out the words of James here. In fact, we would often ask them to, do you have anything that needs to be forgiven? Do you have anything you need to confess? Okay, then as we started the prayer, I would pray for God to forgive me because I didn't want my unforgiveness to get in the way and hinder their healing. And honestly, I've kind of forgotten about that. So this is a good refresher for me to bring something back into our healing prayers that have been missing for a few years. I'm just going to kind of confess that. So I don't think it's like a sin. I just forgot. So I'm challenged by that. The thing is, I realized if that offended someone, they probably weren't going to get healed when we prayed. Their heart wasn't right to receive the healing. we got to get back to the Scripture. I needed to be reminded of this. Here's the final instructions from James. Verse 19, My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away, wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. James is telling us it's our job to try to bring people back that have wandered from the truth. See, people can wander from the church, this church. I want to be clear. People who've wandered from the the truth, the truth that Jesus is their Savior. Go back to the Mars Hill discourse. The, The people that have walked away because they've been hurt. You meet people all the time. They're a church hurt. They've walked away from Jesus because of a human hurting them. It's our job to try to restore them back. If you do, you save that person from death, eternal death. If you look up the Greek where it says you will save that person from death, it literally means, better translated, you will save their soul from eternal damnation, from eternal death. You're, it's not saving that person from dying physically today. You're saving that person's soul from dying in eternal death, from living in hell. Now, I do want to be careful. Some people don't want to come back, and they never will, and we don't need to take this to the extreme of taking on a false burden to get them back. Like, I've worked really hard to get people back harder than they wanted it before. Wendy's helped me a lot with that. uh, Knowing, I'm going to take somebody that's in her family. I gave it everything I had, and at some point we had to realize he doesn't want it. But here's the beauty. That was about five, I don't know, five or six years ago, and now he's getting there finally. The seeds were planted by me and many others, and finally he's getting there in his timing, but he's coming back. He had wandered away, and now he's coming back. So we give it our best shot to help them, but we don't take on the false burden, and we have to learn to set boundaries if they don't want it. But again, this is about the truth. If they're walking away from the truth of Jesus, Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to go into that specifically on the camera. Thank you. It took it took a very hard thing happening in his life for him to evaluate life and to have to face death in the face, you know, look death in the face kind of thing to make him want to change. So if someone disagrees with us and leaves our church, that doesn't mean they walked away from the truth. I just want to be clear about that. I'm not saying you got to go chase down everybody that's left here. Most of them, I'm just going to ask you, don't go chase them down. Can we say that on the camera? <laughs> if they come back and repent, I'll be the first one to hug them. But they haven't necessarily walked away from the truth. I just want to be clear. Walking away from the truth means walking away from the truth of knowing Jesus, believing in Jesus. If we know someone who's losing faith or they have lost faith, we need to encourage them to persevere and endure. We need to be the encouragement for them. Sometimes people just need encouragement. By the way, when you confess your sins to others, sometimes people go, oh, you're going through that too? Okay, that makes me feel better about the you-know-what show of my life. Because sometimes it's just bad stuff happening. But here's a key thing. I can't leave here without saying this. This is one more scripture, one more scripture that disputes this thought of once saved, always saved. It's one more scripture that disputes this thought of say a one-time prayer and everything's good for the rest of your life. It disputes the thought that you can't lose your salvation. We've talked about this many times before. Jesus, Paul, both have talked about not losing your faith, persevering to the end and you will be saved. James says it right here. Some people will walk away. 
They will walk away from Jesus. And if we don't help them get back, they will die an eternal death. That means they lost their salvation. We have to work at this not to lose what we have. He says if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings that sinner back from wandering will save that person, their soul, from death. This is important. James has taught us many things that we need to do. He started with persevere, endure. He ends with persevere, endure. Ask for forgiveness. Pursue righteousness. And it's kind of all a warning to lead up to this final statement. Don't allow the enemy to drag you away from the truth. That's how we're ending this book. Do not allow the enemy to drag you and the people you care about away from the truth. Don't allow the enemy to convince you to reject the truth. The world is rejecting it. The church is rejecting it. Don't go with them. If we understand that this following Jesus thing is tough, it's not easy. If we understand that we need each other for accountability and confession to help us from wandering, then we strengthen each other and our faith grows in tough times. It's important to understand as we finish this letter from James. And here's my final thought. I'm going to be just a few minutes over 1130. I'm sorry. In one of the first weeks of this discussion on James, we talked about the different levels of our walk. Peyton's back there tapping his watch. We talked about one, unbeliever. You just don't believe. Number two, believer. Now you believe in Jesus. Number three is a follower. Now you're actually obeying and doing what Jesus says. And number four was a slave. Remember we talked about that? So where are you? Rhetorical question. Not asking you to answer it out loud. Where are you? Are you number one, number two, number three, number four? Where do you want to be? In four to five months of going through James, have you made any progression from one to the other? <laughs> Parker said he's a slave for somebody. <laughs> Thank you, son, for all your hard work. And maybe you didn't go from believer to follower, from two to three, but you went from 2A to 2B. You got a little closer to follower. You know, I'm just asking you to take steps forward. Have you made progressions? And I'm going to give it to you another way that I've heard it. The first three are the same, unbeliever, believer, follower. But the fourth one is abide. Maybe that's an easier way to look at it. Some people can't get past the negative connotation associated with slave. But I want to present it a different way. What if you abide with Christ? That word is used 118 times in Scripture. I'm going to go through all of them. Just kidding. It means to dwell, to dwell in Jesus, to abide in Jesus. You're dwelling in him. You're not just believing in him. You're not just doing what he says. You dwell in him. You remain in him. You are present with him. You are held and kept by him. You wait for him. It means it's, it's a typical thing where that word means a whole lot more than we have American word. In our, our, you know, it's not like a one-to-one -one translation. But I'm going to kind of say it like this. It's reaching a state where everything you think or do is in response to how does this affect my relationship with Jesus? How does this affect someone else's relationship with Jesus that I influence? How does this affect the world for Jesus? That person may not respond. The world may not respond. But what am I doing that shows them Jesus? Every thought I have, that's what abiding means. So again, if you don't believe, believe. I hope everyone believes. I hope everyone watching believes. I don't know that anyone would pay attention to any of this if they didn't believe. But if you believe, progress to be a follower. Obey more and more. If you're a follower, progress to being a slave or to abide. You want to be moving up the list, right? Here's the problem. You can also go backwards on the list. That's what James has warned us about here at the end. We talk about going forward up the list, but we got to be careful we don't go backward down the list. If you abide, you can go back to being a follower, and you can go back to being a believer, and then you can go all the way to unbelief. Just because you reach some stage or some pinnacle, it doesn't mean you're there and you've arrived and you no longer got to pursue anything. You've got to work to stay there. Keep working on achieving that next level or staying at that top level if you get there. 
So James has given us a book of instructions, calls himself a slave, gives us instructions on how to move forward to abide or be in that slave place ourselves. But he ends with a warning to not go backwards, to help people not go backwards. So my final question for the book of James is, are you hungry? Are you hungry for more of Jesus? For me, as we've gone through the book of James, this, our lives have literally gotten harder. I asked for it week one. I went back and listened to week one, and I asked for it. Our lives have literally gotten harder. We've had more to endure physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. So how do you see us responding? I want to ask that question. How do you see us responding? But when your life has gotten harder, how are you responding? We have to not just read this book. We have to take it and do something with it. Are you hungry? Because if you're physically hungry, what do you do? You go eat. And if you don't eat when you're physically hungry, what happens? You get hungrier. And you lose energy. But here's the problem. When you're spiritually hungry and you don't eat, the hunger goes away. And that's what James is warning us about. Physical hunger doesn't go away. It may for a moment, but you start losing and you can feel it. And your body says, I need it. But when your soul needs feeding and you don't feed it, it just goes numb. Spiritual hunger dies if you don't feed it. So there's a famous TV commercial. I'll probably get criticized for mentioning this in a sermon. And the guy says, stay thirsty, my friends. So I'm going to end with a similar statement that's hopefully a little more biblical. Stay hungry. Stay hungry, my friends. Stay hungry for more of Jesus and closer to Jesus. Father, thank you for the book of James. Thank you that we made it all the way through it. Thank you that you have challenged us. Thank you that you've given us instructions. Thank you for the final encouragements about praying to be healed, about confessing our sins to be healed, about being there for one another, about not sliding back or progressing backwards. Father, I thank you for those that you put in our lives that walk with us and encourage us, that we can walk with and encourage. Help us all to grow together. When we see someone going back, help us to catch them and help them go back forward, Lord. Father, help us to endure to the end, to persevere to the end, and to build up our rewards along the way. In Jesus' holy name, amen.
the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give